second reading. Uh, West Side, New York. Um, second story about animals. There's no one here, so I'm going to read it anyway. I think what settled it all by saying that what they were trying to do was, what they were trying to think of was a way to get the bounces out of Tigger. Because however much you liked him, you couldn't deny it. He did bounce. Oh, I see, said he. There's too much of him, said Revan. And that's what it comes to. It's from Jaws. And uh, the three characters are Cooper, Quint, and Brody. Uh, Quint is the sea captain. Brody is a sheriff that has gone to Long Island to uh, start a new life and discover there's a large shark uh, in the city. And Cooper's a scientist. Uh, this is the uh, monologue of Quint. Uh, and it starts with a scene where they're out in the water. They've already um, shot the shark and they're waiting uh, as night for the shark to uh, exhaust himself. So I'm just going to read it and then I'm going to get out of here. If Rabbit was bigger, and fatter, and stronger, or bigger than Tigger, if Tigger was smaller, then Tigger's bad habit of bouncing at rabbits would not matter no longer if Rabbit was taller. So just the fresh abrasion on his forehead. Well, I've got an idea, said Rabbit, and here it is. We take Tigger for a long explore, somewhere he's never been, and we lose him there, and then the next morning we find him again. And mark my words, he'll be a different Tigger altogether. Quint, that's not so bad. Look at this. <laughs> St. Patty's Day in Nockham, New Orleans, in Boston, where some son of a bitch winged me upside the head with a spittoon. Because he'll be a humble Tigger. Because he'll be a sad Tigger. A melancholy Tigger. A small and sorry Tigger. And oh, Rabbit, I am glad to see you, Tigger. That's why. Quint and Cooper take a long pull from the bottle. Quint, face and head scars come from amateurs. If we can make Tigger feel small and sad for just a minute, we shall have done a very good deed. Nothing, a pleasure scar. Look here, he starts rolling up his own dirty hand. It's a thing which even a very small animal could wake up in the morning and be comfortable about doing. So the only question was, where should they lose Tigger? Cooper. I'll drink to your leg, Quint, and I'll drink to yours. They toast each other and Brody looks around. The next day was quiet and a different day. Instead of being hot and sunny, it was cold and misty. Fell out the tail rope and onto the deck. You don't get bitten by one of those bastards but twice. Your first and your last. And you never see them again. Not never, said Piglet. Well, not until we find him again, Piglet. Tomorrow, or whenever it is. Come on, he's waiting for us now. I think I can top that, mister. Hooper is crawling at his shirt, trying to get it off. But it's tangled in sleeves and won't come undone. Give me a hand here. I got something to show you. Brody lends a hand, and his shirt slips apart. Cooper indicates at his chest. There, right there. Mary Ellen Moffat broke my heart. Let's drink to Mary Ellen. You're always seen and nothing ever happens, said Bruce sadly. What's that one there? Quint, changing. Tattoo, I had it taken off. Is this a picture? So they went. At first, Pooh and Rabbit and Piglet walked together and Tigger ran around them in circles. And then, when the path got narrower, Rabbit, Piglet, and Pooh walked one after another. Come on, what? Quint, USS Indianapolis, 1944. Sometimes he bounced into Rabbit, and sometimes he didn't. And as they got higher and the mist got thicker, so that Tigger kept disappearing. And then, when he thought it wasn't, he wasn't there, he was there again, saying, 
I say, come on, before you can say anything. There he wasn't. Cooper, incredulous. You were on the Indianapolis in 45? Jesus. Quint remembering. Close up on Quint. Now, said Rabbit, and he jumped into a hollow by the side of the path, and Pooh and Piglet jumped after him. They crouched in the bracken and listened. The forest was very silent, and when you stop to listen to it, they can see nothing and hear nothing. For the moment. Yes, you're on the train. Yeah, the USS Indianapolis, June 29th, 1945. That's funny, said Tigger. There's Tigger. There was a moment's silence, and they heard him pattering off again. For a, long, a little longer, they waited, and the forest had become so still that it was almost frightened them. And then Rabbit got up and stretched himself. Well, he whispered proudly, there we are, just as I said. Three and a half minutes past midnight, yeah, yeah, torpedoes yeah. from a Japanese submarine slammed into our side. Two or three, we was still under orders after delivering the bomb, the Hiroshima bomb. I've been thinking, said Pooh, and I think. No, said Rabbit, don't run, come on. And they all hurried off, Rabbit leading the way. Damn near 1,100 men went over the side. Lifeboats was lashed down so tight. To make the bomb run, we couldn't cut a single one adrift. Not one. There were no rafts, none. The vessel sank in 12 minutes. Yes, that's all she took. It's a funny thing, said Rabbit ten minutes later, how everything looks the same in the mist. Have you noticed it, Pooh? Pooh said he had. Luckily we know the force so well, or we might get lost, said Rabbit a half an hour later. We didn't see the first shark until we'd been in the water an hour, a 13-footer near enough. And it was just as they were finishing dinner that Christopher Robin put his head in the door. Where's Pooh? he asked. Tigger, dear, where's Pooh? said Kanga. Tigger explained what had happened at the same time that Roo was explaining about his biscuit call, and Kanga was telling them not to both talk at once. So it was some time before Christopher Robin guessed that Pooh and Piglet and Rabbit were all lost in the midst on the top of the forest. Some of us were dead already in the water, just hanging limp in our life jackets, and several already bleeding, and 300 or so laying on the bottom of the ocean. As the lights went, the sharks came a-cruising. Well, said Christopher Robin, we shall have to go and find them. That's all. Come on, Tigger. I shall have to go and find them, explained Tigger to Roo. May I find them too? asked Roo eagerly. I think not today, dear, said Kanga. Another day. Well, if they're lost tomorrow, may I find them then? We'll see, said Kanga. And Roo, who knew what that meant, went in the corner and practiced jumping out of himself. We formed tight groups, somewhat like squares in old battles. You know what I mean? So that when one come close, the man nearest would yell and shout and pound the water. And sometimes it worked, and the fish turned away. But other times, that shark would just look right at the man, right into his eye. In spite of all the shouting and pounding, you'd hear a terrible high scream. And the oceans would go red. And Piglet said nothing. He had tried to think of something to say, but the only thing he could think of was, Help! Help! And it seemed silly to say that when he had two and rabbit with him. By the first dawn, the sharks had taken more than a hundred. Hard for me to count, but more than a hundred. I don't know how many sharks, maybe a thousand. I don't know. They average six men an hour, all kinds. Blues, macos, tigers, all kinds. Now then, Piglet, let's go home. But poo, cried Piglet, all excited. Cupboard, and they've been calling to me for hours. I couldn't hear them properly before, because Rabbit would talk, but if nobody says anything, 
except those 12 pots. I think, Piglet, I shall know where they're calling from. Come on. In the middle of the second day, some of us started to go crazy from the thirst. One fellow cried out he saw a river, another claimed he saw a waterfall. Some started to drink the ocean and choke on it, and some left our little groups, our little squares, and swam off looking for islands, and the sharks always took them right away. It was mainly the young fellows that did that, the older ones stayed where they was. The second day, my life jacket rubbed me raw. And that was more blood in the water. We walked up together and after for a long time, Piglet said nothing, so as not to interrupt the pots. And then suddenly he made a squeaky noise, and a ooh noise, because he had begun to know where he was, but he still didn't dare to say it out loud, in case he wasn't. I reached over to waken him, he bobbed in the water, huh? and I saw his body yeah, up then because he had been bitten in there. half beneath the waist. Well, Chief, so it went on. Bombers high overhead, but nobody noticing us. Yes, suicides, sharks, all this going crazy and dying of thirst. There was a shout from in front of them, and out of the midst came Christopher Robin. Oh, there you are, Christopher Robin said carelessly, trying to pretend he hadn't been anxious. Oh, here we are, said Pooh. Where's Rabbit? I don't know, said Pooh. Christopher Robin Pooh. Yes, he did that. Yes, that pilot saw us. And early in the evening, a big fat PBY come down out of the sky and began the pickup. That was when I was the most frightened of all. And all that time, he was watching Tigger, who was tearing around the forest, making loud yapping with his little rabbit. And at last, a very small and sorry rabbit heard him. And the very small and sorry rabbit rushed through the mud and set the noise. And it suddenly turned into Tigger, a friendly Tigger, a grand Tigger, a large and helpful Tigger. He bounced, he did, bounced it all in a, just a beautiful way, and Tigger ought to bounce. Just two and a half hours short of five days and five nights when they got me and took me up. Eleven hundred of us went into that ocean. 316 got out. Yeah, 1945, June 29th. Anyway, we delivered the bomb. Oh, Tigger, I am glad to see you. Cry, grab it. That's it. That's it.